Okay, let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, I4 Energy seminar. My name is Gay Minyi. I'm the uh, technical director of the I4 Energy Center. And we're very fortunate to have uh, Milo Werner uh, from Tesla Motors come uh, speak today. Um, Milo has been with Tesla Motors for, uh, it's about five years since 2007. Uh, first as a new product manager, and now she is the manager of new product introduction. And in that position, he is, she is responsible for the successful launch of all new uh, vehicle powertrain models. Uh, key projects include the Tesla Model S, uh, the Toyota RAV4, and the Daimler Smart Car, as well as the Mercedes uh, A and B classes. Uh, prior to Tesla, Milo was a member of the engineering team at Jacob Associates. Uh, she has a BS in Civil and Environmental Engineering and a BS in Geology from the University of Vermont and a MS in Civil Engineering and MBA from MIT. So let's uh, welcome Milo. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so I think it was summarized here, but I'm from Tesla and I manage new product introduction um, for the power team, powertrain team. And um, essentially that is everything that makes the car go. It's um, everything from the battery to motors, inverters, chargers, superchargers. And um, I also manage both our internal programs and our external programs. So any partnerships we have with external companies, those powertrains um, all come through my team. And. Um, Essentially, my goal at Tesla is to help engineers kind of develop their ideas and then help them launch them into production. And I also help them understand whether they should be insourcing them, making them in-house in our own internal factories, or whether they should be outsourcing them um, to partners. So um, what I was hoping to do in this presentation is kind of walk you through um, kind of that development and also help you understand with your own products um, if you should be insourcing or outsourcing. And so, how many people in this room is, are um, engineers? Good, good. Okay, of those people, how many people are developing like hard goods products that you can touch? Good. Okay, good, good. <laughs> um, so, so for those people who raised their hand just on that last question, this talk is like directly applicable to you. Um, okay. Okay, so we're gonna talk about my role, Roadster, startup sourcing strategy, and then wrap up with some questions. So I thought you'd enjoy some pictures of when I um, was fresh out of MIT and I, I joined Tesla. I essentially wrote the spec at Tesla on where to ship your stuff to Tesla. So <laughs> just to, like I started at the way bottom and you know it was like ship to Tesla in San Carlos and it was, I took the job. I was like groveling to get in the door. I would do anything that they wanted me to do. And I was, you know, straight out of grad school. Um, so I don't think most of the grad school students were quite as desperate as I was to get into Tesla. But hey, I love it. Um, and then here's kind of a more recent picture of us launching our first um, production line in the Fremont factory. And this is um, our battery uh, module line. So this is kind of some of our very core um, technology. Uh, Here's Elon here standing, you know, proudly in the back, very excited. Um, okay, so today, you know, you've got your startup idea, and essentially you are Elon like 10 years ago, Elon and JB. Um, you've got your idea, you've got some investment, and you're thinking about bringing your product um, to market. So um, this is going to be an interactive presentation, so I apologize. I mean, I don't know if I apologize, but I expect participation. Um, so what would be some of the first things that you would think of that um, you would need to do in order to get your product to market? Money. You need, you need money. You need money. Yes, you need money. Good, good call. Um, so um, next, you can imagine that the people who are giving you money are demanding that you make them more money. Like that is the essence of venture capitalists. They like to go home and feel warm and fuzzy, but really, you know, they want you to make them more money. So how, you know, now you've got this load of money, how are you gonna make them more money? Um, so, yep, you gotta sell your product. So you've gotta get 
You, yes, you need a good story. So you're going to need ado adop adoption, right? You're going to need people who want to um, take on your product. And the only way to get that is to get making it and making it as fast as you possibly can. So, so your investors are going to be pushing you really hard to get your product to market as fast as you possibly can. And um, they're going to have different strategies than... Um, you know, maybe internally your strategy might be. And so that's kind of where this back and forth between outsourcing and insourcing comes back and forth. Will you be able to get your product faster to market if you insource it or if you outsource it? Cool. Okay, so now we're going to just um, go over the, I'm going to talk about two main decisions that Tesla made. Um, one was the battery pack and one was the kind of vehicle structure. Um, so we partnered, for the vehicle, we partnered with Lotus, and um, they're located in England. They're, um, yeah, we partnered with Lotus, and you, you guys all know what a car looks like. And then there's the battery. And so here, oops, yep, I think I was meant to do that. So here is the battery, this kind of silver block. I'm going to show you some more pictures, and I'll give you kind of a quick description so you get an idea of, like, how a battery is made. And here's another battery, kind of a... Oh, yeah. In what state yeah. were the cars coming from Lotus? Um, we'll get to that. Um, so here's your battery again. Take a nice zoomed in picture of it. You can um, see some things in here. You can see it's, um, it's like a metal enclosure uh, with a fair amount of energy on the inside. Just, just a, just a little bit, a little bit of energy. Okay, so um, this was our initial manufacturing strategy. We were going to uh, make our motor and our pen and our battery over in Eastern Asia. Uh, the battery is getting made in um, Thailand. The motor and pen were getting made in Taiwan. Um, at that point, um, you couldn't actually airship um, lithium-ion cells because it was considered dangerous goods, and so they had to go by boat. So we're going to put them on a boat. I'm not sure if they were going through the Panama Canal or down across, over the Cape, but whichever way they were going, it takes about 45 days by ship to get them over um, to Lotus. So here's Lotus in England. Um, Lotus, the plan was for Lotus to build up the whole vehicle um, and then take our powertrain and install it. And then they were going to come back uh, to the U.S. So here, I don't quite have the, the mode of transportation probably accurate. I think they were, the plan was to have them come through the canal and up the coast to San Francisco. Another around 45 days. So, so you've got a, kind of a lot of inventory on the water. So I'm going to need um, two volunteers. Okay, I'll, I'll narrow it down for this like, massive array of hands. Who likes the idea of outsourcing? Okay, um, look at the guy in the tie-dye shirt. Yeah, come on up. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so this is your side of the board. This is um, benefits to outsourcing. Okay. Oh, I'm losing my mic. Sorry. Um, okay, so blue is what you're going to write everything up on the board with. And um, uh, red is going to be for Roadster, I mean for the vehicle buildup. Lotus, and we'll get to this part next, sorry. Green is going to be for battery. Okay, now I need somebody who is um, pro in-house, like we should build our factory from scratch in mine or out of the mountain below it. <laughs> come on! Okay, come on up. Okay, so you are, okay, benefits, you are... Um, Benefits, shoot, sorry. Benefits 
to making in-house. Okay, you have the same strategy. Green is for battery, red is, um, so let's just have like a quick brainstorming session here. Um, why you would want to outsource. Let's just like get the ideas flowing here. You guys are not chatty. <laughs> okay, so benefit of outsourcing would be it would be cheaper. I just use the blue for like general ideas. You might need the skill set that you don't have in your own company. Mm -hmm. Yep, that would be a benefit for outsourcing. Greater experience in the manufacturing facility someplace. They might have a factory already set up and ready to go, waiting for your product. Well, we won't go too fast. Standards compliance and interoperability. They may already have something that's tested and know the work of This is going to be long. I and that was just Cool. You develop in house expertise that allows you to debug things. And have a fixing in production. Yep. You don't get bumped from somebody else's priorities. <laughs> Well, our making house volunteer is um, writing. Let's think, um, you know, one thing that we missed on the benefits of outsourcing is um, you could imagine that um, your vendor might already have established relationships with parts suppliers. Um, so efficient parts tool chain? Or maybe like a developed supply chain. They already have a developed supply chain. So if you needed to buy um, copper windings, Right? Normally, if you called up the supplier out of the blue and said, oh, I need 10 copper windings, please, they're going to say, oh, I'll get that to you in six months. Um, right? Whereas you can imagine if one of their best customers called them up and said, I want 10 copper windings, they would say, when? Um, I think uh, just one other piece here on the, um, on the control of technology. I think just one uh, interesting point on that is that uh, you can get an IP around your technology, but often like your in-house um, methodologies are um, uh, something that you need to defend that you can't patent, right? And so part of the reason that many of uh, Tesla or like Tesla's factory is often not open to the public is because our methodology for making um, things that we make in-house is proprietary, and, um, but we can't patent it, you know, or we choose not to patent it because, you know, your patent's up in seven years, or I'm not quite sure how many years it is, but your patent will expire, and, you know, then it will be broadcast to the world exactly how, you know, the, what you consider to be your IP at that time. Um, you, employees from defecting, information? you don't make it a big deal in your factory, like this is the special sauce. They don't know it's a special sauce. Everybody uses glue, right? So, okay, so let's um, kind of, we're gonna go th for a little, where's my clicker? Uh, factory tour of um, our uh, battery manufacturer that we selected. So um, they're located in Thailand. 
Their expertise was in um, fabricating sheet metal parts. And um, essentially, they were giving us a very um, kind of blank slate in their factory. We got a you know, wide open um, factory floor from them. So here we are. We're driving up to the factory. It's like a total greenfield factory in Thailand. Here's some of their kind of expertise. They're, they're, they do a lot of sheet metal work. You know, they're known for their barbecues and heat lamps. Um, <laughs> Sounds like a battery, doesn't it? Um, so, you know, here's a picture of some of their um, soldering, stamping presses. You know, they've got pretty good equipment, and you can see that the outside of that battery pack was definitely like a very uh, big, you know, sheet metal enclosure. They've got uh, powder coating capabilities. Okay, so we arrive. So um, just off the top of our heads, um, with, the, with the green color, you know, what kind of things would you think that this um, supplier is bringing to the market? We're gonna, we'll do some more, but just like off that like short little slides, what would you think they have? Could they step up production volume quickly if needed? Yep, they, they've got a factory, they've got a lot of people there. Yes, they have a, you're right, they're, they're inexpensive. Um, anything else? Specifically about this factory? Yeah, just think, this is like the factory, you're thinking like, ooh, would I want to outsource to these guys? Expertise in heat transfer? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So that would be an existing skill set. They, they, you know, they've got some existing skill sets, right? They know how to make sheet metal. Yeah, it's a pretty, it looks like a new factory, I agree. Yeah. Are there any environmental regulations that come into play with the battery ingredients? There, there isn't as much because we don't actually make our own cells. We buy them. Um, and so I think some of the disadvantages of going to this factory would be for a battery. Location. Shipping time. Shipping time, yep. You're sending a lot of your engineers over there for extensive amount of time, right? Tesla was a pretty small company at that time. I think we had about 200 employees doing everything, right? There's probably about you know 10 to 15 people on the battery engineering team. You could imagine that spending, sending three of your people over there would be kind of a sink in your um, capabilities. Communication problems with the language especially. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, sorry. Go. <laughs> yeah. So um, here we are. This is the, our welcome sign that we received with their heat lamps proudly displayed. And here we are in our office um, with their barbecues all like lining <laughs> the room. <laughs> um, yeah. Here we are with our prototype. So when we when we came um, to this factory, we had built ten prototypes. So we were still very much in the development phase and the design phase of the battery. You can imagine on your first product, after you've built 10, you know, it's not like you have a lot of like product design expertise in-house. I mean, you, you do, but you're still very much developing your internal design capabilities while you're also designing this product. And I think um, that's very classic for new startups, right? You're, you're a young company that is still developing those capabilities. Um, so let's go on into the factory. Here's a picture of our factory floor. Here's our four tables that we put in it. It's a major facility. Hold on here, I'm catching up with where I am at on my slides. Okay, so then it comes down to like, you have to start getting equipment, right? And we, we've, we've made 10, so we have some equipment at Tesla, but we don't have a lot of equipment at Tesla. So now we're trying to communicate with our supplier all the things that we need that we want them to have when we get there. So that includes like sending thousands of pictures of stuff that like anybody here in the US, you told them to buy a spatula, they would know to get, right? But sending an email to somebody in, in 
Thailand, I want you to buy a spatula. They're going to be like, mm, can you send me a picture of that? Or, you know, you never know what size spatula they're going to get. They could get a massive spatula or, you know, who knows what they're going to get. So anyway, so we send them tons of pictures of all the stuff. This is like off engineers' computers. <laughs> Mixers, yes. <laughs> like, like everything on the face of the earth. There you are. You're like emailing, taking a picture. So you can really see that the language barrier um, pays a huge toll in going overseas to a country that, um, you know, doesn't speak English. Okay, so here we are. We're back at our factory. Our four tables have turned to six. Um, and now we're working on a, you know, a piece of the module. And so um, the module is essentially um, made up of lithium ion cells and it has like a tube that goes through it. And here they are you know, with the tube, trying to figure out if they can make the tube in-house or they're going to have to buy it out of house. And so um, I think this picture says a fair amount about their engineering capabilities. Here they are. They're on the ground with a one-to-one -one drawing, you know, trying to bend the tube so it's the right shape. It doesn't, like, fill you with confidence that, like, <laughs> when you send a drawing that they're going to, you know, that they've got their totally level granite slab out and they've got like their precision measuring tools. No, they're on the ground like with their piece of aluminum trying to make it fit. So here we are, you just um, here's a lesson that's being given by the engineer. Um, this is Jason Mendez and he is teaching this team how to build a module. And here you can see the module. And so this picture, she's translating. This picture, he's talking, and now they're laughing at what he said because they're not really sure what he said, <laughs> right? And so every kind of one of those communications takes twice as long to happen uh, than it would happen here in the U.S., and you have to be there in person to make that communication. So here they are doing a little assembly. Magic sauce. The magic sauce is right there. <laughs> And you're seeing here that, um, that this really isn't looking like a barbecue, right? Like this isn't the core competencies that we went to them. Now is not feeling like, hmm, this is our battery pack isn't quite that similar to a barbecue. Um, but they do have a lot of inexpensive labor, and, and we're utilizing that. And this is kind of probably a primary reason why we thought that the inexpensive labor would be a key driver for our costs around the battery pack, because you can see each one of these cells is getting hand-packed um, into a module. And so here, are the, here they are, you know, one by one, putting them in. They're looking at it. Okay, so here we are back at our factory. You know, all we really have is the stuff that we've told them to go out and buy or the things that um, we've brought with us. It, and I think this picture looks relatively like Bayer. You know, there's not a whole lot of, well, let me catch up here. So, um, interestingly enough, um, you know, here we are, we've got our lithium ion cells. One piece that I left out is that we bought the lithium ion cells for our supplier. So we are doing the holding cost of our cells um, there. And, you know, they, some of the cells, you know, started to walk away and and, you know, we realized that maybe the security wasn't great at this factory that we were at. Um, and so, you know, the very next day, they put up a fence around our, our, around our area, our, our you know, six-table factory. And I think one of the interesting parts about that is, you know, if you tried to put up a fence in the United States, you know, you got to go through the planning group and you got to get, you know, approval from Palo Alto City, make sure you got emergency exits. I mean, it could be like six weeks before you got a fence put up. Here, it's like the next day. So it, it was it, a very resourceful, you know, unregulated location as well, where when you needed to get things done quickly, it just happened. Fence? <laughs> yes. Um, so here's a picture of our fence. There are a lot of pictures in here, so. Um, did the fence solve the problem? Yeah, for, for the most part, it did solve the problem, interestingly enough. It was enough of a deterrent. Um, here we are working, and just to come back to that resourceful note, um, 
you know, their, their people were always building us kind of interesting pieces out of the technology that they already knew a lot about. So here is a sheet metal holding piece. And so what it, it does is it, you know, kind of holds our modules in a vertical position, right? We might not have necessarily designed it out of sheet metal and, and you know, they just in their off hours went and made that for us, which was convenient and nice. Um, okay, so here's a little bit more uh, on their kind of like engineering capabilities. They're doing a flow test through this piping here, and you can see we're out by the drain, you know, <laughs> outside the factory. Not like a huge test lab or anything. Here's some more test equipment, you know, made by two by fours, kind of like nailed to a table. It, it, you know, this is really showing that like if you, you know, it might be easy to buy in the United States, but it might be a totally different beast to try and get in another country. You know, they're getting a lesson on um, kind of connecting the cells. And here's a, here's a picture of them doing a little like, you know, last minute touch up to our enclosure. And, um, you know, after about three months they produced, you know, we got 10 battery packs out. And so, you know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't mind blowing speed, needless to say. <laughs> Quality control testing, you know, the uh, we did, you know, some of that equipment that you saw, the, the stuff of the two by four, you know, that was some quality testing equipment. So, um, so anyway, so let's just um, revisit and make sure that we didn't miss anything on like, should we be outsourcing or not? Any kind of like final thoughts? What do you guys think? Charge ahead? I think it took a lot longer than we had anticipated. Mm -hmm. And now they're getting on a boat, right? <laughs> so our engineers are going to go home and take a vacation <laughs> while they wait for these packs to arrive. Or How long does it take to fuse a pack? Because you have 7,000 cells or 8,000, something like that. So how long does it take for one worker to do that? Yeah. Um, it's probably around a week. One man hour week for one pack. So. And was this factory working single shift a day? Well, I mean, there's our team, so. Yeah. And the, the age of these people is like, the, just looking at the age of them is, scares me. <laughs> um, you have fast ramp up capability, because flexibility and production volume rapidly changing is almost day and part day. Yeah. You might not have Let's talk about that experience shop. Who is an experience shop who builds large scale battery packs? Anybody got any ideas? They just built the cells. They don't link them together. I was just gonna ask, what was the nearest closest analog to the Tesla battery pack when you guys started? Um, no other car company was using lithium ion packs when we launched the Roadster. But in any other, in, in aerospace, in any other industry, is anybody using large lithium ion battery packs? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think. Like, what are the numbers? You know, I'm going to say I don't know, but I'm not sure there were that many people using large scale lithium ion battery packs. <clears throat> Yep. Right. Yeah. Yep. And there are, you know, this, these same cells that go into our pack also go into computers. So, you know, the, the cells in this pack is the same as computers. So, so I think we're touching on an interesting point that, you know, there really weren't that many people making large format battery packs at this time. And essentially, we were teaching the supplier our technology. 
And on top of that, we're taking more time to develop it because we're spending a lot of time in Asia, you know, traveling over there, sending our engineers, but, you know, obviously the whole engineering team isn't going, but there's, you know, that gap in time, the communication, um, the language barrier, so ne and, you know, the unfamiliarity with the supply chain over there. Um, you know, it's taking us longer to try and develop it overseas at somebody else's factory. Was there a conscious decision made to do all the spot welding manually, or was that just the default? I think that was just the default. Is the only you know, it's like you're seeing like pack 11 there, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, it's not like we had like done it many, many times. Right. Well, I mean, like, the alternative to going to Thailand and getting Brazilian people who can spot weld is to go to Japan and have them build a piece of equipment. Yeah, yeah, it's a very good point, you know, that we chose the low cost because we had people hand packing cells, but um, potentially that wasn't the most expensive part. And that's something that you won't learn until you actually get figuring out your manufacturing process, right? So going so early on in the launch phase to outsource it, you know, maybe you would wait a little bit longer, develop your capabilities in-house till you felt confident about it, and then move it out. But in reality, you know, when you have your, when you're developing your capabilities in-house, you're allowing the um, iterations on your product to go so much faster that, you know, thinking about outsourcing it is hard. After you've already gotten your line up and running smooth, you're like, mm. I mean, it does happen, um, but maybe not at the rate that we are going to start launching cars. Yeah, I think in the end we decided it wasn't a big piece, part of the picture. So you could have done it in house, but you didn't know that when you started. Yes. So we took our six tables home and <laughs> hired some technicians and started our own factory in the garage. Is essentially what happened. We didn't even have to move. That is the technology that we had at the time. So I can't really speak to the side of, you know, the engineering side if there was a different way to, uh, you know, assemble that cell shape. But, I mean, you don't know if anything's changed in the room? I know that nothing has changed. It's a great point. Those packs were all shipped back to California, heavily tested, and then shipped to Lotus. Because we didn't feel that comfortable with shipping them directly to Lotus. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. And the hope was is that we would eventually be able to like wean our San Carlos office from having the pass through of material because, you know, every time you stop at a port, it's a two week, you know, it's a Couple days to get it off, couple days to go through customs, couple days to get on the truck and get to your location. You work like crazy. Um, and actually, once it got to the US, it could be airship because there was some, a certain, um, you could apply for different visas for your lithium ion packs. Do you have a chance to look into Eastern Europe for potential facility location? I, I, we, you know, we didn't look that closely into, into Eastern Europe. I think when we, got to this point of realizing that maybe we wanted to bring this technology in-house instead of teaching somebody else how to build, um, you know, our, you know, core IP, we decided that we would bring it in-house and bring our IP. Um. So how, how many battery packs have you produced since? A lot. So we made 200, I mean, 2,500 Roadsters, um, and then the program ended in December. Um, and then we've made, I don't know, thousands of other flavors of battery packs. Okay, moving on to the vehicle. So this, we're like kind of turning the tables here, 
it's, it's not actually, um, so we went to Lotus. Uh, they're a low volume manufacturer. They usually make about 40 vehicles a week. Uh, they have a massive parts bin, right, because they already make cars. They're located in the English com countryside. Their typical vehicle is like a lightweight, bare bones, two-seater. Um, and then a lot of their business, the majority of their business is from um, uh, engineering contracts with other European automotive companies. You know, so they are really you know, known within the automotive com uh, industry to have um, some very solid engineering capabilities around vehicle, vehicle handling, um, and vehicle design. So here's a picture of the Lotus paint shop. Maybe we should stop here and just think, um, well, let's keep going. And we can think a little bit. I, I think one thing I want you to think in the back of your heads is, what kind of things did Lotus have that we you know, didn't have? Or we're not going to be able to develop ourselves in a realistic amount of time. So here's the, kind of one of the first roadsters uh, getting our battery pack installed. There they are, trying to make it fit. One of these pictures has a hammer in it. <laughs> there it is. I love that picture. You're like, mm. <laughs> it's not going together quite like we anticipated. And did they have much prior experience with doing extrusion Monaco stuff like this rather than tube chassis? They, um, they had a, a, you know, we, they actually buy their chassis from another vendor. So their vet, we bought, you know, essentially bought a lot of our material from their vendors. We, we leverage their supply chain a lot. Same headlight manufacturer. You know, we're only making 25 a, a week. I mean, how many suppliers are gonna wanna talk to you if you're just making 25 a week? Like, they're gonna be like, mm, that's like a week run a year for us. Or, you know, it's, it's just not very high volume. Oh. Uh, one of these pictures, we have like a tarp over the battery pack in the back, which I enjoy. Here, here we're like hiding that we're like partnered with them. Um, I don't know if we're hiding that we're partnered with them, but we are covering our pack like it's our special sauce, which it is. Um, here we are, assembly. And here's the car once it gets out on the manufacturing line. So one of the, the great things about um, being uh, the Lotus was able to accommodate on us us with is that their lease could go down and, and our Roadster could go interspersed, right? So they'd run, you know, 20 Elises, 20 Teslas, 20 Elises, 20 Teslas, right? And the, you can see they've got a pretty mature manufacturing um, process here. They've got parts bins here, a Kanban system. Um, although our process was very standardized. And there wasn't much switching cost? I mean, you didn't see a quality control issue when they switched from their lease to the, to the Roadster or vice versa? We didn't actually. We didn't have that problem. So let's just brainstorm a little bit some of the reasons why it would be beneficial to partner with Lotus. <laughs> they will speak, we will speak English, yes. Skilled labor. Yep, they've got a lot of skilled labor. labor. Yeah, setting up an automotive factory. I, I mean, Tesla has a you know five hundred plus million dollar loan from the government. Like it's, we've now showing that it's very expensive to set up a. a reputational advantage in that um, you know their chassis dynamics reputation will help you sell cars, whereas as a startup in California, it would be difficult to develop that reputation in the Yeah. Well, this is a very attractive design of the chassis, right, which you couldn't necessarily replicate. So you might as well buy <coughs> Yeah. They, uh, they designed a slightly different body shape than the Elise, but it's not that different. <laughs> so the point out Europe, and so if also the Eastern United States, you could have gotten outsourcing much more with lower overhead costs than going to Thailand. Yeah, yes. Um, it was expensive to go to the UK, um, but there weren't, in, in the end, there weren't that many automotive companies that we found that had such a low volume line, right? There, most car companies make, you know, well upwards of a couple hundred vehicles a day. So you can imagine trying to get on that line is, they're like, 
the, your peanuts. But I would have thought it would have been for you in a buyer's market because there's so much overcapacity for automobile production in the world overall that you could have had your choice of any number of Chinese or Malaysian or any number of car, car factories would have probably rolled over and happy. Yeah. The well, Lotus is up by the Malaysians. <laughs> yeah. We are a pretty no-name company at the time. You know, uh, you call it, we spent a fair amount of time just calling up people trying to find if someone would be interested. Um, what would be some of the disadvantages? I think this is one thing that many people here with a startup will, um, a new startup will want to partner with an established company, right? You think, you look at uh, O Power and Honeywell have partnered together and you think, why wouldn't I want to partner with an established company like this? Pretty much we've listed tons of positives, like they got a factory, skilled labor, they know how to do it. You know, it isn't, you know, terribly, building a car isn't that unique. So, so what are some of the disadvantages? They could go out of business. They could go out of business, that's a good point. There are two things around innovation. One is that um, because they're established and they have ways of doing things, they're going to want to shoehorn you into their way of doing things, and you're going to get less innovation because of that. The flip side is that you are not going to learn as much about how to build your vehicle if they're doing a lot of the work and using knowledge that they already have sort of tucked away in the back of their heads and they're not going to be able to document easily or transfer easily without you actually going and doing the work alongside them. Yeah. Let's, um, did you guys have any ideas or? They're just going to be like control, I mean like to essentially mitigate any problems that may happen where they want like degrees of equity and control in the company in different aspects mm -hmm. or you know, things like that. If they see that you're doing well, they could bump you and try to take your technology or do something very similar because they've seen how to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, uh, one thing I just wanted to touch on that you said was um, kind of slow down your innovation. And, and I, has anybody here ever worked in a startup that's partnered with a more established company? Yes, you know about this. Yes. But, but you know, I think the other thing can happen too, you can learn from somebody and then you can say we can do this better. So I think it has two sides to that. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's a two-sided for sure, you, you can learn from them. I think one of our experience was, is, was that um, Lotus has some very uh, established processes. And specifically when it came down for us trying to drive cost down efforts, you know, trying to um, make our design more efficient and uh, rolling in those material changes was very difficult. Not, not prohibitively difficult, but the speed at which we wanted to roll in these changes was um, limited by their process. The other thing is, Lotus had cachet, so if you had partnered with like Fiat, and the Fiat's doing fine now. <laughs> <laughs> um, they would just say it was a, it's a Fiat on batteries, but Lotus was, you know, James Bond wrote that as a cool car, so there's probably some cachet effect too, and you're creating a cool car. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> One thing is, as you scale up production, there's going to be places where you're going to have to retool and, and then restructure. And so the high cost, so at the early stage, again, going from the production prototypes to low scale uh, production, uh, would imply that you, in outsourcing, you really want to look for expertise because it's very costly with your engineers. But you, then you're going to, after you go from low, the, the low production to some higher level, you're going to have to look at some point we're going to have to go through another step, and at that point, we may want to switch our priorities to pay lower costs. Yeah, it's a it's a very good point. I think I try and focus on kind of very entry level startups, like this is your first product, and how are you going to um, like what kind of strategies can you use to make a decision whether to outsource or insource, so that maybe you can learn from some of the lessons here. Um, how many more pictures? Close. Oh yeah, here's a, we're back to our old map. So we changed this strategy here. Um, so instead we decided, you know, that we were gonna make our batteries in-house. We had Lotus assemble the body without any powertrain in it. We continued to get our motor and PEM from Taiwan. We had them all shipped to California, to Menlo Park and um, final assembly happened there. And it took us about two hours to assemble it in. And, and you know, the majority of our customers were on the West Coast. So it had to come there anyways. 
Um, I feel like we've talked about this a lot, but I think just the two key points to really take away is it's very hard to develop your product at an outsource suppliers. Um, and uh, there, you know, many, there are some pitfalls that can happen when you outsource that I think we talked about with the battery. Um, but there are also some uh, wonderful benefits that you can have as well. So, okay, what do you guys got for questions? I talked a long time, sorry. Okay, we have some open. Oh, we have a question from the web, yeah. which we normally don't get. <laughs> Thanks for standing up, volunteers. <laughs> um, this is from. Um, well, this is from oh. UC Davis. Mm -hmm. uh, so what impact does the announcement of the supercharger stations for Tesla cars in California uh, going to have on the electric car market overall? Um, that is a great question. I'm not really allowed to speak on the topic of Model S, so I apologize to everyone who came here who wanted to ask me Model S questions. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. I, li I like corporate handle Model S questions. <laughs> and then question two, why did Tesla license the powertrain instead of designing themselves? Uh, I'm not sure about that question. We, um, the question from what I heard was, why did we uh, license the powertrain instead of designing ourselves? So we, we do license our powertrains to companies like Toyota and Daimler, but the design is all done in-house. Are there any other questions here? Can, can you yeah. wait one second? You don't hear yourself speak because we turn off the microphones, I mean the speakers, so there's no feedback, but the microphone is on. Okay. What were the main difficulties partnering with uh, Lotus? I think fundamentally um, there were probably uh, two challenges. Uh, the first one being uh, the iteration of change was was very difficult when you have you know such a new car right we didn't you know most automotive companies build you know a hundred demonstration vehicles before they actually start selling to customers we built probably on the order of 15 so you're going to be getting that feedback for improvement very frequently and you're going to want to respond to that improvement immediately Right? And, and working with Lotus, it, because they have such set processes, it was very difficult to speed up that feedback loop. Uh, when you negotiated with their outsourcing company, how did you uh, convince them like, to explain about their uh, marketing incentives? So I think at that time there was no EVs out, outside the you know, market, and you know, everyone was sometimes skept skeptical about the uh, that EV becomes a really popular. And I think an uh, outsourcing company also has a certain hesitation to invest the money to put their new facility to create uh, those for those EVs. And yeah. how did you manage those? Yeah, you're, you're right. And I think a lot of um, young startups will face that same challenge where you're bringing a technology to the market that no one has ever used or tried. And, and the partnerships that you try and make, you might not be received with open arms. Um, and so we had a prototype um, that we um, definitely invited um, partners to come and um, drive. And uh, I think as many of you know, our um, efficiency combined with acceleration really made our product unique because the Roser had great acceleration. So it was kind of an inspiring product for them to be able to use. Yeah. Um, look, did the engineers, and especially the design and manufacturing engineers, um, change the way they designed and manufactured future iterations after learning from this experience? Yes. Did they yes. Any examples you could um, share? Or? 
So we, it, I think one of the it, one of the wonderful benefits about bringing the battery pack in house was that the engineering team sat like 50 feet away from the battery pack manufacturing line, and so whenever there was a question or an issue, you know, they could work very closely as a team to resolve that issue. And so now we always have a pretty extensive development line in the same offices as um, the engineering team and manufacturing team. So, and that's my job is to run those development lines. Um, with engineering that falls, you know, kind of in my realm. How many Teslas are there on the road right now? 2,500. We made them. <laughs> so it's, it's quite a few. Could you talk at all about the uh, sort of sourcing decisions on the uh, motor and inverter combination and on the vehicle computer? Um, yeah, so the, the power electronics module um, is what the Roadster had, and um, we, I took that part of my talk out actually, <laughs> sorry. Um, we partnered with a company over in uh, Thailand, Taiwan, sorry, and um, they primarily made high-powered testers, um, high-powered electrical test equipment. And um, in that kind of industry, they go through a lot of um, product line changes because after one company gets their testers, they really don't order any more, right? And somebody else wants their set of, you know, 25 testers. So um, they were actually a pretty good fit because they were very accommodating to, you know, the frequent changes that as we improved our product. Uh, the downside was is that they didn't really do a whole lot of, um, they weren't like a, a technical or a, they weren't a contract manufacturer frequently. So developing those terms and conditions when we really hadn't done it too many times and they had really hadn't done it too many times was kind of difficult for us to kind of feel like it was a, it was just challenging when you partner with someone else who doesn't out, isn't a contract manufacturer frequently. So they were taking a design from you for the inverter and manufacturing the inverters. Yep. Oh, so sorry, that was, that was just um, our charger. We have like an onboard charger and um, uh, inverter. They used to be combined in the power electronics module. Now they're separate, but they were combined then. And then the motor was um, made in our own factory in um, Taiwan. And I don't actually know as much about the motor factory. Um, it was our, uh, it was like a, it was technically our factory. Um, Uh, I think, I don't know about that one. I can't speak to that. Question back. Um, so I understand that Tesla is still um, low volume manufacturing of cars. So do you have any plans to scale up or you sense that there can be some barriers for you to scale up? So I think because your body part supplier Lotus is also a low volume a supplier, so if you want to scale up, so will there be any difficulties to um, to still use the same supplier, or what are the other factors you need to consider? Yeah, I think um, it's a, uh, this is, I, how do I go about this? So we did start with the Roadster, and it was a pretty expensive sports car, so it was a pretty limited group that was gonna be able to afford the sports car. Uh, the, the base price of the Roadster was $109,000. Um, so there really wasn't a massive market for such an expensive sport car, sports car in order to kind of ramp up. And so we have been working our way down the value chain. So now we're at the four-door sedan, which is built in Fremont, um, which is, starts at $47,000. Um, and I know there are plans and desires to move um, farther down the chain and make an even more inexpensive electric vehicle. So how about the Yes. Um, yes, we'd very much like battery technology to become less expensive. <laughs> <laughs> we are working on that. <laughs> um, and I think we're making great progress, but. Question, Parker. Thank you for your talk. You came with two different answers to two different problems with outsourcing. On the battery pack, you decided to bring the technology in the house and on the body, on the chassis, and the glider, you decided to stay with Lotus, okay? So if we go beyond Tesla for a moment, you know, 
What would be the general word of wisdom? In which case would you decide to outsource, or and in which case would you decide to bring the technology back in your? In I your think place? that's a, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, fundamentally, it comes down to what you consider to be your core competency. Um, as a startup, you may be forced to outsource in the very beginning because you may not have the capital to make your um, own, but you should always be trying with your core competencies to bring it in-house. Um, yeah, uh, does your battery allow a, a battery swap, like a, a better place what they're doing? Yeah, the roaster and did not allow a battery swap. Okay. It so took about two hours to swap out the battery, so it took like a three hours on a fast charge. So you might as well, at that point, you should just plug it in. Okay. So how much the weight of the battery in terms of uh, the compare with the gross weight? Yeah, the battery is about 900 pounds. Uh, what's the total weight? The vehicle, I think it was like, it's pretty light vehicle. It's, it's just under like 2,000 pounds. Might be right around. I don't, I don't know the exact number, but the battery was like the majority of the weight and it was in the back of the car. 2,000 Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, can, can you speak to the performance of the battery packs and the roadsters over time? Um, how would, have, have they shown to hold up? Um, the only speaking to that that I can do is that we do have a Roadster battery pack like legacy line and it is barely ever running. So it sounds like good news to me. I think uh, that's all the questions. Uh, thank you, Myra.